Welcome to My Favorite Mystic, a podcast about the weird and wonderful world of mysticism. I'm your host, AJ Langley, and today I'm joined by Lauren Cole. She's an independent scholar, and her research interests include gendered constructions of authority, the presentation of Adam and Eve, and the use of female embodiment throughout the works of her favorite mystic, Hildegard of Bingen. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me today. It's lovely to be here, Amanda. Thanks for having me on. As though your introduction didn't give it away absolutely and completely, you are here today to speak to us about Hildegard of Bingen. Always. Ready and able at any time to talk about Hildegard of Bingen. But before we talk about her amazingness, let's talk about yours. So how did you first get interested in mysticism as a subject? So I first became interested in mysticism when I was doing my undergraduate degree. And I took this unit, which was called Speaking with Authority, Women and Power in the Middle Ages. And I thought it was going to be about queens and like super powerful political women. And it wasn't at all. It was about religious women and female mystics who I'd never encountered before because I don't have a religious background. So I never encountered religious women in any meaningful way before. And I was just fascinated by these women. Originally, I wanted to study... Elizabeth of Shonell. But because I was an undergrad, I didn't have any Latin. I didn't have access to a lot of texts. And basically, I just didn't have access. So I turned to her contemporary, Hildegard of Bingen, uh, whose works were all translated nicely into English for me. And I never looked back from there. The importance of a good translation can never be overstated. So you found her out of the undergraduate necessity of finding a translated mystic. But what's kept you interested in her for all of this time? So what's kept me interested in Hildegard in particular is the way that her different works interact with each other. So she wrote all manner of texts. She wrote medical works, as well as more typical religious texts, like her theological works. As soon as you sort of start reading the two together, you see these huge connections between what she understands in the spiritual world and what she understands in the physical world. And the connections between them have not been studied massively. And so really, I just keep finding new connections between the two. So like in her theology, for example, one of the major concepts is veriditas, which is kind of almost like a divine greening. It doesn't translate very well into English, but a kind of a divinity within nature. And then as soon as you go to her medical works, you see her explain how the divine and humoral theory come together in the human body to create this kind of divine greening or this divinity within nature. And so this connection between the theology and the medicine keeps me coming back every time. Are you interested in the history of medicine more generally? Oh, that's a great question. You know, my knowledge of medical history is fairly limited and I was very much introduced to medical history by Hildegard and now I've started to look more into medical history I can't stop myself and I keep finding incidents where people claim that this was the earliest herbal written by a woman throughout history and none of them are as early as Hildegard so now I've got like a mission within medical history to carve out a space for the good name of St Hildegard of Bingen as what I know as the earliest surviving herbal written by a woman. Absolutely defend Hildegard against these pretenders to the throne. It's important to remember that even though they had a lot of fantastical experiences, mystics wrote a lot of serious, important things that really deserve examination. Absolutely. And Hildegard wrote the earliest surviving description of a female orgasm written by a woman. When I tell people this, they are shocked and surprised by this because she was a nun, because she was a mystic, and she's known for her religious work. And yet, absolutely, these women are multifaceted, and we can see her really as a what we'd now call a polymath. Well, let's talk a little bit about her mystical facet. How does she describe her relationship with the divine? What does that connection look like? So Hildegard's primary experience with the divine is through visions and she's very explicit in how she has or experiences her visions and she says in the preface to her first visionary work quote the visions i saw i did not perceive in dreams or sleep or delirium 
or by the eyes of the body or by the ears of the outer self. But I receive them while awake and seeing with a pure mind and the eyes and ears of the inner self, as God willed it. How this might be is hard for mortal flesh to understand, end quote. I mean, you're telling me, Hildegard, I've been researching <laughs> you for seven years this year. It is hard for the mortal flesh to understand. But you can see from that quote that her primary way of connecting with the divine is through vision and it's within the tradition of prophecy. So she very much removes herself from the body and from bodily experiences in how she describes her visions. But we know that, of course, that bodily experiences are often very central to mysticism. And I think this is where the separation of Hildegard from mysticism comes. But if we look more broadly at her whole life, she actually uses her body a lot within her divine experiences outside of the visionary realm. So, for example, when she's 42 and she is told by God that she cannot keep her visions a secret any longer, she has to tell people, she is struck down with a massive illness and that's a divine message from God and then she realises that she has to spread his word and she learns that through her bodily experience and then when she wants to form her own community of nuns later in her life. The monks at Dissi Bodenberg are like, no, you're too famous. Your reputation here is too strong. You cannot leave us. And she again is struck down by a mysterious illness. And they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. She's faking it. But the archbishop turns up and takes one look at her and is like, that is divine illness. We have to let her go to form her new community at Rupertsburg. So she absolutely experiences divine connection using her body, which I don't think that has to be central to mysticism. But even if we want to use a more strict definition of mysticism, then she's still having bodily experiences. And as those who listen to the podcast will either know or figure out shortly, we hold to no such strict definitions of mysticism here. The fact that you're using a very broad definition of mysticism, I think, is really commendable because when I first started researching Hildegard, I encountered lots of people who were like, well, is she really a mystic? Almost, I think gatekeeping is a strong word, but I'm going to say it, gatekeeping mysticism. And I agree with you that we should define mysticism as seeking a connection with the divine through some sort of religious experience. That's how I would define mysticism anyway, and even that might be a little bit too tight. I mean, for the sake of the podcast, I'm not even keeping it to the divine. I mean, bring me a scholar who's got a favourite demoniac, and I'm right in there. But for today, our focus is Hildegard. So, can you tell us a little bit about her life and work? She was a visionary mystic who lived in 12th century Germany. She was a Benedictine nun, and she led a community of nuns. And she's one of only four female doctors of the Catholic Church, which means that her theology has a special authority. And actually, all of the female doctors of the church are mystics, which I think is interesting. So to give you a little overview of what she accomplished in her lifetime, it's a lot. So firstly, she composed three works of visionary theology covering the entirety of salvation history. And that is what she's best known for. She also composed one of the largest surviving collections of medieval music. She was extremely influential politically, both inside and outside of the church. And we have around 300 of her letters which survive. And these are basically her giving advice to everyone from popes to kings and queens to emperors to fellow abbesses, monks, pretty much everyone. She created her own secret language that her nuns communicated in. Just a little off-the-wall fact there. And finally, she wrote works of medicine and natural philosophy, including the earliest surviving description of the female orgasm by a woman in the Western tradition. And to top it all off, she started her public life at 42. She didn't tell anyone that she had visions until then. And that's when she started writing and composing all of her work. So everything she did, everything we know her for, she did in the second half of her life, which I personally find extremely comforting. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that's hugely comforting. So she wrote on a wide variety of topics. What do we know about her education? We know 
that Hildegard was educated as a Benedictine nun. So we know that she would have been exposed to biblical study, to not only scripture, but also popular or common exegeses, such as those of the church fathers. We also know that she was educated by another nun called Utah, who was a few years her senior, and that their education was likely quite comprehensive. So we know that Utah was well educated, but unfortunately she died quite young, so we don't have work surviving from her. But what we see in Hildegard's work is enormously wide ranging and identifiable influences from contemporary theology, from medicine, from knowledge of political events that are going on, such as conflict between the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope. So we know that she must have had quite an extensive education and that she must have had a lot of contact with what was going on in the outside world. However, because she's writing as a woman, she is not allowed to reference that she has this knowledge. So she is very explicit at the beginning of her first ever work, her first work of visionary theology, the Scivias, to say that her knowledge comes purely from God. And she explicitly says that she herself does not have knowledge of the scriptures and of exegesis, that these have been literally placed into her head by the divine. I mean, that's fairly typical for a female mystic of the period. But I'm wondering how that works in practice, especially considering her medical texts. Does she also claim that those were placed into her head from a divine source? Her medicine is definitely a combination of her divine knowledge and her, let's call it human knowledge, but she doesn't explicitly reference where the knowledge has come from. But of course, we know that there are many, many influences within religious and her medical works. But in the medical works, she doesn't reference the divine voice and she doesn't reference any particular medical theorists or anything otherwise she just presents the knowledge as it is these are her theories this is her compilation in the medicine and most of her theories of medicine are a combination of divine and humoral theory so for example she talks a lot about sexuality in her book causes and cures human sexuality reproduction conception the whole kind of process and she relies both on knowledge of Adam and Eve and knowledge of how humoral theory affects, for example, the menstrual cycle to give advice for people who may be infertile, for people who are choosing the right partner to have a child with, for people who are choosing when to conceive their child. All of these issues she sees as both um, divine and earthly. Why was she so interested in reproduction? What role does that have in her own experiences? As a Benedictine, Hildegard would have practiced what we call monastic medicine. And as a community of women, that would have focused a lot around reproductive medicine for the local community around where she was living. So her nuns would have practiced reproductive medicine in terms of advising on contraception, on helping with pregnancy, on assisting with, with giving birth, and aftercare as well. So she would have actually had most likely a lot of experience in reproductive medicine. And that I think really shines through in the medical works because in terms of reproduction sexuality, that is where she has the most detailed explanations of what happens, what goes wrong, and what can fix it. So in my mind, this work was written to assist her nuns in helping the local community. And in this period, when we're talking about medicine, we're really talking about the humoral system. So how does Hildegard incorporate ideas about the four humours into the medical advice that she gives? 
Hildegard uses the humours in about a million different ways, and many of them are actually inconsistent. It's not a guidebook for medicine in the way that we might recognise a guidebook. So she uses the humours to describe people's personalities, a bit like we might use a horoscope. She has this whole section in Causes and Cures, her medical work, where she talks about the different personalities and they are related to the humours. So you have the sanguine person, you have the phlegmatic person. And she talks about how they are compatible and how they create healthy or unhealthy children. And I think what this probably is, is a reflection of the anxieties around the high levels of infant mortality amongst the communities that she would have been serving with her medicine. And so I don't know whether she or her nuns would have specifically given advice on this or whether it is simply a reflection of something they have observed and something perhaps that they would like to give advice on or would like to find an explanation for. I love the idea of matchmaking based on people's varying balances of humours. That's fantastic. But one of the things about the humours is that they are in flux, that you can adjust them. So how does that work with this idea that they affect personality? Surely they're alterable, so one could just change their personality to be more compatible with their partner. While she writes that you can dial up and dial down certain humours when it comes to treating certain medical conditions, the humours are also naturally dominant in a person's personality. And this raises an interesting point, actually, because she doesn't just talk about physical health, in the medical works she talks a lot about mental health and about just general well-being and the mind as well as the body and she sees these as very interconnected so her entire understanding of the world is as interconnected and we see a lot of the medieval fixation on microcosm come through in hildegard's work she sees the human body as a microcosm of the physical earth and therefore that there is an enormous connection between the health of the body and the health of the earth Um, and she's very popular in eco-criticism circles as well and then that the physical earth is a microcosm of the spiritual world so that there's kind of three layers within that and so for her divine experience comes not just through the microcosm of the soul uh, as as microcosm of the spiritual world but also through um the connection between the body and the physical earth because the physical earth is a microcosm of the spiritual world so therefore it is another way of accessing the divine and in her theology she uses this concept of viriditas which doesn't translate well into English, but means a kind of divine greening or a divine nature um, in plants. Um, So within her theology, you see her speak of both the physical and corporeal world and traditional spiritual roots, both as ways of accessing the divine and both as legitimate ways of doing that as well. And do these ideas about interconnection and the importance of both the body and the soul, do these contribute to her attitudes towards asceticism and the human body in a more general sense? Yeah, completely. So she's all about balance in her work and she views the body as not as important as the soul, but important in similar ways as the soul is important because the soul is connected to the spiritual world directly, but the body is connected to the natural earth, which is connected to the spiritual world. So it's one further step away, but it is still a connection with the spiritual world. And therefore we should be respecting our bodies and treating them well. And that is a way of honouring God and also accessing the divine rather than using ascetic practice. So perhaps denying yourself food or or hurting or damaging body to induce religious experience hers is almost the opposite that 
we should respect the body as it is intimately connected with the spiritual world. As an example, she she wrote this incredible letter to her younger contemporary Elizabeth of Chonau, where she basically tells her off for engaging in ascetic practice and reminds her that God wanted our bodies to be balanced and for us to look after ourselves. That focus on balance is so refreshing and kind. And I like the idea of moderation rather than excess when it comes to religious practice and this emphasis on taking care of yourself. And you can really see that come through in her medicine. So her medicine is all about balance, about not eating too much meat unless you are old or ill, about not drinking too much alcohol, about getting the right amount of sleep, about taking the right exercise, all the kinds of things we might consider to be wellness in the modern period. And that is a reflection of her as a Benedictine, as a nun, as someone who engages in monastic medicine. So there's all these other influences on mystics that we, I think, lose by bundling them all together in this pattern of mysticism. And speaking of the various influences on these women and their texts and their theological understanding, one of the things that you're working on is the representations of Adam and Eve in Hildegard's texts. So could you speak a little bit about that and maybe specifically about their role in her medical works. So Hildegard uses Adam and Eve a lot throughout her work, and in her first visionary work, The Scivias, she has a very typical view of the roles of Adam and Eve. So Eve is portrayed as weak and as being tempted by the devil, and there's a sexual element to that in The Scivias as well, because the devil invades Eve and that has sexual connotations. But when we turn to causes and cures, the medical work, we find a much more complex theory or theology of Adam and Eve and their relationship to human sexuality. So it moves away from a typical view of Eve as sexual temptress and the cause of original sin and the sexual nature of that sin and into a much more nuanced understanding of the role of Adam and Eve. And actually Hildegard places the blame more on Adam, both blame for the fall and blame for original sin and the sexual nature of that sin. I have a quote about that that I would like to share. So the quote begins, God created the human being and all animals were subject to serving him. But when man transgressed God's order, he was changed in mind and body. The purity of his blood changed to another type, so that instead of purity, it throws off the foam of semen. If the human had stayed in paradise, he would have continued in his unchangeable and perfect state. But these all changed after the transgression into another bitter type. The blood of a man boiling in the ardour and heat of lust throws off foam, which we call semen, just as a pot placed on the fire sends foam out of the water from the fervour of the fire. She then goes on to talk about how semen is both how original sin is passed down and also how different quality of semen can affect conception. So she uses a broader or or deeper understanding of the theology of Adam and Eve to then talk about both the spiritual effects of their sin, and the physical effects. And she ties all of it together with this focus in her medical works on reproduction. I can see why this has been such an interesting topic for you. We're coming to the end now, so is there any final thought you'd like to leave our listeners with with regards to Hildegard and her works? The one thing I would like to leave people with about Hildegard's work is that it's all interconnected and we cannot examine one area of her output, say her theology or her letters, without looking at her work as a whole. We often think of medieval people as being kind of one thing because they're famous for one thing. So that's the thing that they thought about and wrote about. But actually, they're multifaceted, complex human beings like the rest of us. 
And if we're lucky enough to have different facets of their personality and interests recorded, we should do them the honour and the service of trying to understand them as the full human being that they were. Medieval people were also people. What a wonderful final note to leave this on. Lauren, thank you so much. And where can people find more of your work and your spreading the good word of Hildegard? You can find me primarily on TikTok, which I know may be a new platform for many people listening. But come and join me. My handle is at Medieval Lauren. And I make videos busting medieval myths and talking about the weird and wonderful medieval female mystics. I also started the hashtag Hildegard Talk, so that should give you a good idea of what I like to talk about. You can also find me on Twitter at the same handle, at Medieval Lauren, and on my website, medievallauren.wordpress.com. And I've placed links to all of those in the show notes. So please go find Lauren and check out all of the amazing services she's providing to the world of mystics and medieval history. Lauren, as always, it has been a joy talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's just super fun. Love to talk about my gal Hildy. And thank you all for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at MyFaveMystic. And join me next time when I speak to Anat Klafter about Marjorie Kemp.